like to give a special welcome to our distinguished guests, which is a delegation from the office of the Prime Minister of Kuwait. And we're very glad and honored to have you here. We're equally honored to have a uh, distinguished uh, lecturer today, someone I actually haven't seen for about 20 years, um, Dr. Robert Friedman, who is the Peggy Meyerhoff Pearlstone Professor of Political Science at uh, the Baltimore Hebrew University. Emeritus. Uh, Emeritus, yes. <laughs> and is current, I better put my glasses on. <laughs> and is currently a visiting professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University, where he teaches a course on the Middle East and on Russian policy. He's a prolific author, has written five books on Soviet and Russian policy. He's written on uh, Israel and the Middle East. He's written on uh, the Middle East peace process. Uh, and is currently uh, his newest book, uh, which is, is Contemporary Israel, Israel's Politics, Political, Economic, and Security Challenges Since Rabin. He's currently completing a book on Russian foreign policy toward the Middle East since the collapse of the Soviet Union, and has begun work on a book on U.S. policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict in, uh, under the George Bush administration. Uh, Professor Friedman is going to speak today about Russian policy toward the Middle East under Putin. And I think I'll leave the introduction at that. I could go on for a long, long time, given his achievements. Um, and I, you, Dr. Friedman will, uh, will speak for the length of time that he feels is necessary, and will then be happy to do a question and answer session. And after that, there's tea and coffee. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you very much, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, my mother would have loved the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, let me also add my words of welcome to the delegation from Kuwait, uh, which actually has a tie to the Middle East Institute here. Way back in 1988, when I was in Moscow, the current head of the Middle East Institute here, my, Dr. Michael Hudson, invited me to dinner at the Kuwaiti Embassy in Moscow. It was a wonderful evening. Uh, and I was able to ask lots of questions about the reflagging policy, if you remember that, uh, in the 87-88 period. So I want to extend my thanks to the Kuwaiti delegation. Uh, it was a wonderful evening at the embassy, which I uh, still remember with pleasure. <clears throat> okay, as Mr. Dorsey mentioned, today I'll be discussing Putin's policies in the Middle East, both in the period he was president from 2000 to 2008, and as Prime Minister, which has been since then. My lecture will be divided into three parts. First, an overview of Putin's goals in the Middle East, which have remained the same both as President and Prime Minister, because most of us who study Russia believe that it's Putin and not Medvedev who really is the dominant figure there. The second part of the lecture will be a brief survey of Russian policy in the Middle East under Yeltsin from 2001 from 1991 to 1999, and finally we're going to look at Putin's strategy. And we're going to look at four periods of Putin, from 2000 to 2004, when the strategy was basically defensive, from 2004 to 2008, when the strategy was basically offensive, then from 2008 to 2010, when as a result of the world economic crisis, uh, Russia went somewhat back onto a defensive policy, or at least a, le a less aggressive one. And I'll conclude with a very preliminary analysis of Russia's reaction to the current, what I call, Mr. Dorsey and I were discussing this before, the current period of revolution in the Middle East. And uh, before you all get your hopes up too high, I'll give you a definitive explanation of what's going on in the Middle East and what Russia's policy should be or will be. Uh, I just want to recall at the very start of the lecture the words of Cho Enlai, who you remember was a very important Chinese leader. In 1954, he was asked what his thoughts were of the French Revolution of 1789. And Cho Enlai's response was, it's too early to tell. Here we are, you know, two months into what I call the Middle East Revolution, so my words on that and my policy will necessarily be uh, very tentative. All right, let me now start with Putin's goals. Number one goal, restore the reputation of Russia in the Middle East. 
Under Yeltsin, as we will see, Russia had dropped from being a superpower to a great power to a middling power and was rapidly on the decline. It was the goal of Putin to restore Russia's prestige. Number two, business. And here's a huge difference from the Soviet period. Putin is very, very interested in improving the Russian economy. And I'm going to list a whole series of things here. Number one, he wants to get orders for high-tech Russian companies. Reactors, you all know the problems the Russians are now having in Iran with Bushir and Kuwait being downwind from Bushir. That's a very sensitive issue I know with, with Kuwait and also with Saudi Arabia. Railroad construction, high-tech railroad construction. The Russians were building a railroad or a project for it in Libya and have got a tender for building a railroad between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem uh, in Israel. Arm sales, which run the gamut from sophisticated jet planes to surface-to-air missiles, both long-range SAM-300 and short-range tour missiles, ground-to-ground -ground missiles, especially uh, these Kender missiles, ground-to-sea missiles, a whole array of arm sales, which earn good hard currency, and also putting satellites in orbit. Russians are even-handed when they come to putting satellites in orbit. They'll put Israeli satellites in orbit, and they have. They put Saudi satellites in orbit. So this is one of their big uh, goals. Number two, though, under business is they're looking increasingly for investment from the oil-rich Middle East for the Russian economy. This was particularly clear in 2008, 2010. Now, we'll talk about Putin's visit to the Middle East in 2007. We actually actively solicited uh, Arab money. Uh, he's actually been successful. We've gotten some from the UAE and some for Saudi Arabia for investment projects within Russia. Uh, a third goal under business is to improve high, import high-tech technology, such as nanotechnology, which they are importing from Israel. So business, a central feature of uh, Putin's strategy. Number three is energy. And again, you have a division here. Uh, Russia's oil and natural gas, as I think most everybody in this room knows, the Russians are having more and more difficulty in producing it. It's more and more expensive, and it's hard to get places, whether offshore in the Black Sea or up in the Arctic. Now, to compensate for this, the Russians have adopted, under Putin, two strategies. One is to solicit Western investment especially in the Arctic drilling, but also in the Black Sea. You see companies like Francis Total, Norway's State Oil, and BP actively in <coughs> investing in, in drilling. But also, there's an effort to get oil and natural gas from the Middle East. Companies like Luke Oil, Rosneft, are actively looking for deals and have made deals with Saudi Arabia, with Iran, just to mention a few, because they can produce the oil much more cheaply and much more easily, and, and that uh, enables Russia to either use more oil domestically or export oil um, around the world. Uh, number three under energy, and especially as regards to Turkey, uh, Turkey and Russia have developed a symbiotic relationship on natural gas. Uh, well, the first deal was in the 1980s. major deal was signed in 1997 called Blue Stream, which, if we can get back to the map somewhere, yeah, brings the natural gas down here to Turkey. And the Turks would like, ultimately, to be an energy highway in the Middle East. But meanwhile, they get upwards of 60% of their natural gas from Russia. And finally, in liquefied natural gas, LNG, uh, they are cooperating with countries like Qatar uh, and also Iran and Algeria and trying to form a mini OPEC or, or gas OPEC uh, there. And we'll talk about that. Now, the fourth goal, one that doesn't get a lot of press, but I think is probably of equal importance to the other three, is to minimize Arab and Muslim support Islamic rebellion in the North Caucasus and especially in Chechnya. And the Russians have done this by cultivating both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, from which money to the Islamic rebels in the Caucasus have come, 
they've gained observer status in the Islamic Conference, which they did in 2005. They've gotten a higher Russian quota from the Saudis for the Hajj. Uh, the latest quota is 20,500. And they will send ambassadors to see, oh, Muslims have it very good in Russia. So this is, these are the goals. And, and we'll try to fill in, uh, as we go on, how Putin is achieving. But let me now turn to the Yeltsin period. Uh, in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, until Mr. Yeltsin collapsed at the end of 1999. Basically, during this period, Russia was on the defensive. All over the world, it had very serious domestic problems because of the selling off of government-owned firms. Prices increased 23 times, so if you had, for example, a, a loaf of bread that cost one ruble in 1991, by the end of 1992 it cost 23 rubles. This had a horrendous effect economically and politically, and Russia was really consumed by its own internal problems for most of the period, especially 2001 through 2004. Now there are two exceptions to this. One was Turkey and the other was Iran. And I, I need to speak about both of these. If you notice on the map, Turkey and Iran both abut the Caucasus, and Iran abut Central Asia. From the Russian perspective, the Caucasus and Central Asia are, what we say in English, uh, I, I hope an expression that you know, the soft underbelly of, of Russia. They're very, very concerned, and, and hence, uh, during the Yeltsin period, Turkey and Iran were given primary emphasis in Russian policy toward the Middle East. And the Middle East, which had been a huge issue for Soviet foreign policy, really shrank under Yeltsin with those exceptions. In the case of Turkey, in most of the 1990s, it was sort of a love-hate relationship. Uh, the Russians accused the Turks of aiding the Chechen Revolution, the Turks accused the Russians of aiding the Kurds in their uprising against Turkey. Uh, at the same time, however, when the, and this says something about the Yeltsin presidency, at the same time when the Russian foreign ministry under Kazirov was lambasting, was seriously criticizing Turkey for its mistreatment of the Kurds, the Russian defense ministry was selling helicopters to Turkey which it used against the Kurds. So you had, in some ways, chaos in, in, in Russian foreign policy under Yeltsin, which, as we'll see, Putin was going to uh, take care of. Now, you almost reach a crisis in 2000, excuse me, in, in 1997, when the plan was to sell SAM-300 surface-to-air missiles to the uh, Greek section, southern Cyprus. Now, those missiles would basically cover the entire airspace of Turkey and led to a huge crisis in Russian-Turkish relations. Uh, the Russians, however, decided to shift it over to, to Greece, and that crisis ended. Then in uh, 2000, in 1997, excuse me, you had the huge Blue Stream natural gas deal, which I alluded to earlier. This made Turkey dependent on Russia for natural gas, and this really has become the foundation of the relationship. And ever since Blue Stream was signed in 1997, relations between Russia and, and Turkey are in the upswing. The other problem, however, was the straits, and this isn't going to be solved uh, until a decade later. Uh, with the Russian oil now going through the straits, you had an increase in the number of tankers passing right through Istanbul, and for I'm sure many of you have been in Istanbul, you know how narrow the straits are, how foggy they get, and you know, if one of these tankers explodes, you're going to damage a large part of Istanbul. So the Turks pressed the Russians to build a separate pipeline down here to alleviate the pressure in the straits, or Burgas Alexandropolis up here, so as to minimize tankers coming through the straits, and We'll talk again more uh, about that. Now, in the case of Iran, the Russians had several interests. One was simply selling arms. The US embargoed the arms, as you know, 
after the seizure of the American hostages in 1979, the stockpile of Iranian arms had gone down very severely during the Iran-Iraq War uh, from 1980 to 1988. And basically, the Iranians needed a new source of arms. The Russians are only too willing to provide those arms. And this is something Yeltsin did. Really, the only anti-American thing Yeltsin did during his period, uh, early period of his presidency. Uh, in 1995, there's an agreement both to build a reactor at Bushir uh, in Iran and also to sell a centrifuge system, a nuclear centrifuge system to Iran. The U.S. was able to pressure Russia to drop the centrifuge, but not uh, the Bushir reactor. Uh, so you had this situation. Uh, with the Chechen war raging through most of the 1990s, off and on, the Russians were very, very worried that the Iranians would back the Chechens. After all, you know, fellow Muslims under threat. But because they were arms recipients from Russia, they kept a very low profile on Chechnya, both in the early period and the lower period, so low, in fact, that the Saudis criticized Iran for being non-Islamic in, 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 in the 1990s over the Chechen issue that for the Saudis is going to change uh, with the next decade. Now, the third player, and a much less important one for Russia during this period, was Israel. Where Israel had been a pariah for Russia from 67, this period of the 67 war, when relations were broken until Gorbachev gradually resumed relations from 1985 uh, to 1991 when they were full diplomatic relations. Uh, for the first year or two, 1991, 1992, 1993, there was a sort of a honeymoon uh, relationship between Russia and Israel. Basically, the attitude was, well, if the Soviet Union was against it, it had to be good. So the Russians then embraced Israel. And uh, you had you know, a million Russian speakers go from the former Soviet Union to Israel. Very strong cultural ties. Uh, economic ties began to pick up between the two. Uh, the Soviet ambassador was very popular in Israel. There's was actually cooperation on military equipment where they jointly built an AWACS plane for sale initially to, to China. That was nixed by the U.S., uh, but then to India, which was approved by the U.S. because it had some American technology in it. basic idea is the Israelis would provide the avionics, the Russians the airframe. Uh, so there was a lot of this kind of cooperation, which continued through most of the 1990s, especially economically. Uh, because their Russian TV is very important in Israel, where there's channels and, and Russian newspapers, etc., uh, tourists from Russia to Israel felt very much at home. They could see Russian on TV. They could read Russian newspapers. Um, and uh, to the point that sometimes Israeli companies uh, actually advertised on Russian TV, so it could then be broadcast into Israel, and they had a milk in space commercial, which was one of the more popular ones, as the Russians put up one of the Israeli satellites. So that was through most of the 60s, when Yevgeny Primakov, the old Russian hand, became foreign minister. There was a chill in the relationship beginning in 1996, particularly with a clash between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, but by 1998, Russia was in the midst of a horrendous economic crisis. Uh, stock market fell 75%. Ruble was devalued five times. And Russia was a mess. And if you have to make matters worse, then a new Chechen war broke out. And this is what confronted Mr. Putin when he took office. Okay, 1999, uh, as the third prime minister a year, and then anointed as president by uh, Mr. Yeltsin. Now, the first thing Putin did in surveying the wreckage, and we can only call it wreckage, of Russian foreign policy during this period, was to consolidate power. He fired a number of ministers from Yeltsin. Uh, Gazprom minister gets fired. Uh, uh, Minadam, Ministry of Atomic Affairs guy, gets fired put his own people in who he could trust. Uh, Russia has uh, 89 regions, more or less. Some of them were pushing for more independence. 
what Putin did was put basically seven plenipotentiaries, which means special representatives supervising the regions. He also took over the newspapers. He got rid of the oligarchs who had made a lot of money and were exercising a lot of political power. Some of the names you know, Berezhovsky and Khodorkovsky, who just got a new jail term, uh, you know, who, because he was going to dabble into politics. So by the end of the first year, he had gained control over the media, he gained control over foreign policy apparatus, he gained control over, full control over the military. And in the Duma, the Russian parliament, which had been such a problem for Yeltsin because he had opposition from the communists, from the nationalists, from many others, he established his own party called United Russia, and he was in control there too. So this is very important, in the early stages, very much in control. Then when uh, Afghanistan war broke out, uh, Russia was very helpful to the United States. And was it altruism? Not really. Uh, the Russians are very worried about the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan uh, as a threat. Uh, they're worried about the Taliban as a threat. So anything the U.S. could do to destroy the Taliban and the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan was a net bonus. For, for Russia, the Russians did facilitate a uh, movement of goods to Afghanistan through Russia, something they'd once again done, and didn't oppose the establishment of American bases in Central Asia. So this was sort of a, house, a very positive period in Russian-U.S. relations in 2001-2002. In, uh, now, those relations, and it's important to talk a little bit about U.S.-Russian relations because it does affect the Middle East. Uh, relations began to break down for a couple of reasons. In part, as again I'm sure everybody here knows, one of the policies of President George W. Bush was to push the expansion of NATO uh, to include the Baltic states, once an integral part of the Soviet Union and earlier Tsarist Russia, after all. This was Peter the Great between 1700 and 1725, a long time ago, had conquered those areas and made them part of Russia. So this was an alienating factor. So too was Iraq. Now, if you look at Russian policy to Iraq prior to the American invasion and afterwards, prior to the American invasion, as you know, Saddam Hussein was under sanctions. The Russians were the leading force to try to get the sanctions lifted, hoping to get much more business in. And this was an area of rather great friction, especially between then Secretary of State Colin Powell uh, and, and the Russians. But after the U.S. invaded, and the fact was that France and Germany, if you remember, opposed the invasion, only the United Kingdom, actually, with the big Europeans supporting it, Russia joined the alignment of France and Germany uh, as it decided to see if it could isolate the U.S. in Europe. But while that was going on, the Russians suddenly had to confront another problem. And that problem was Iran. At the end of 2002, as sure you, again you remember, the revelation came that the Iranians had a secret nuclear program. And you had a centrifuge plant uh, that they had built themselves with some Pakistani aid. And uh, that was a major thing, a heavy water plant and other nuclear activities. And between 2002 and 2005, the Europeans and the United States were trying to pressure Iran to drop their nuclear program. And the Russians, again, this is more or less a defensive period for Russia in the Middle East. I want to emphasize this. If you look at their rhetoric, on several occasions, Putin himself said that if the, if the Iranians don't cooperate, we are not going to supply nuclear fuel to Bushir, which was, uh, again, an area of leverage for them. Um, and that pretty well brings us to the end of what might be called the defensive period of Russian policy under Putin. Beginning at the end of 2004, and certainly into 2005, 2008, we have period three, which I call the offensive period uh, of Russian policy. Now, the offensive period involved a number of things. Uh, 
And, but before we go into what it involved, we have to figure out why did it happen. And it went so far as in Munich in 2007 to have Putin denounce the United States as worse than the Nazis. You know, that, that indicates that you've become serious zero-sum game policy again in the Middle East. Now, why did this happen? You have to understand a little Russian history. So if you'll forgive me, we'll, I will have a, a brief excursion into Russian history. As you know, Russia's been invaded many, 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 many times. The Mongols did it, the Huns did it from the east, and the Swedes did it, the Poles did it, the French did it, the Germans did it from the west, and there's a certain paranoia in the Russians about invasion, etc. And that sticks in people's minds. And they still remember when the Poles, Poland sat on the throne of the Kremlin in 1612. And the, and the feeling was, when we are weak, the foreigners will take advantage of us. Now, from an objective point of view, you know, Russia has thermonuclear weapons. <laughs> Nobody's going to invade Russia anymore. But this mentality persists. And if you go back into Russian history, at the time of Stalin, if you remember, he did the rapid industrialization and collectivization period in the 19, end of the 20s into the 1930s. And he pushed very, very hard, and five million people died uh, in collectivization. And he was asked, why are you pushing so hard? You know, this was before the rise of Nazi He said, we must be strong, because when we are weak, we get beaten. The Japanese beat us. The Mongols beat us. The Swedes beat us, the French beat us, the Germans beat us. You know, the same theme resounds. So please remember this. How does Putin jump in here? The end of August 2004, this is just a few months after he was re-elected president, you see the hijacking and blowing up of a plane. Uh, and most horrendous of all, the attack on the school in Beslan in, uh, in the North Caucasus is leading to the death of 332 Russians, most of them children, in a bungled rescue operation. And of course, this is done by the Chechen rebels. Now, Putin seized on this to say there are people out to destroy Russia. And I read his speech, and I said, my God, this sounds like Stalin's speech in the 1920s, justifying collectivization and industrialization. When we are weak, the, they take advantage of us. Therefore, we must be strong. So what does he do? Domestically, the one actual in area of independence people had in Russia up to 2004 was they could elect their own governors of the 89 provinces. He jumps that. Now they'll all be appointed from Moscow. And this further centralizes the power you know, of Yeltsin. But then he runs into another shock. And there are elections coming up in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine, as you, know, you can just see just a little bit above the blue there, in, in, uh, in Russia was where Russia was born. And it's a critically important country uh, for Russia. And there was an election campaign between Putin's person, Yanukovych, and a guy named Yushchenko, who was pro-NATO, and anti-Russian. Putin put his prestige on the line, back to Yanukovych. It was a fixed election, huge popular protests, orange revolution, boom. Re-election, Yanukovych loses, Yushchenko wins, second major blow to Putin. So now you've had Beslan and you've had the orange revolutions. Russia's looking weak. So Putin, what does Putin do? He looks around for an area in the world where Russia can, can start looking good again and strong again. And that area just happens to be the Middle East. Why the Middle East? A, the American invasion of Iraq has gone horribly wrong. And you have a rising rebellion against the US occupation, and also beginning to have serious clashes between Sunni and Shia, plus Al Qaeda operating as well. So you have that. You also have the revival of the Taliban in Afghanistan. So the American position is weakening, and George W. Bush is increasingly isolated on the world stage. So the Middle East looks like a very interesting 
target of opportunity for the Russians. This, in some ways, reminds me of what happened during the 67, 1967 war, with the, where you had the U.S. bogged down, if you remember, in Vietnam. You had the Chinese, then the Russian enemies, bogged down in their cultural revolution. The Middle East looked very, very promising. Got, that sucked the Russians into the 67 war, later the 73 war, but again, the Russians seeing similar opportunities. The one difference, however, is that Putin, when he starts his offense in the Middle East, includes Israel, whereas in Soviet times, Israel was isolated as the linchpin of Western imperialism in the region. Now, Putin is embracing Israel. Why? At least on the bilateral level, a number of reasons. High-tech trade, uh, and I've mentioned nanotechnology, number one. Number two, you had a million Russian speakers there in Israel. Putin thought this would be a lever of influence. And by the way, I should mention that when the foreign minister of Israel becomes a Russian immigrant, the current one, Lieberman, and you have four ministers in the Israeli cabinet who are former members of the Soviet Union, then Putin may say, hey, we're getting more influence. Because look, and uh, a friend of mine actually works for Lieberman. And, and he, re, he related to me the dynamics of the relationship between Israel and, and Russia. He said, uh, the Russians are so happy now. Why? In the old days, they would have to call up, make an appointment, get an interpreter. And it takes so long, we get very little done. Now, they call right up on the phone. Language of discussion is Russian. One, two, three, boom. So you had that dynamic going on. And you had uh, cultural ties, economic ties, military ties, I've already talked about. Totally on the bilateral level. Regionally, however, the Russians were working against Israeli interests. Selling arms, nuclear reactors to Iran, protecting Iran against uh, sanctions the UN Security Council, uh, arming Syria, <coughs> and as we'll see in a minute, recognizing uh, Hamas, the Russians trying to have vis-a-vis -vis Israel a policy, if I may use, forgive me for those of you who are not Native American speakers, but it's a good expression for you. Having your cake and eating it too is an American expression, and that's what they're trying to have with Israel, where you have good bilateral relations even though you're working against Israel in the international scene, at least in, in the regional scene. But anyway, that relationship continues and as we want to draw it down, despite aid to, to, to Iran, uh, despite aid to Syria, the bilateral relationship continues and continues to this day. Uh, the Russians, uh, the Israelis, even going so far as to agree to uh, have a, an international peace conference in, in, uh, in Moscow, having a relationship uh, where they call Russia a strategic ally. Quote, quote, you know, some of this sounds almost unbelievable. Uh, and of course, after the Georgian War, selling Russia drones. The Israelis are very good on these unmanned aerial vehicles, and the Russian performance was so bad in that in the Georgian War, this certainly helped out. Anyway, I went to the Israeli Foreign Ministry and did some interviewing on this. I said, what are you doing? You're agreeing to this from the Russians? You agree to call them strategic ally? You agree to go to Moscow for this peace conference? And look what they're doing with the Iranians and the, and the others. <laughs> and the Syrian center, why are you doing this? And the guy looked me straight in the eye. This was the, uh, the guy who handles Russian affairs at the Israeli Foreign Ministry. He said, they could be worse. <laughs> so I, I'll leave it at that. Anyway, Putin comes to Israel and this tour of the Middle East, Egypt, Israel, Palestinian territories, offers the Palestinians 50 armored personnel carriers for their military, showing the flag. We are big in the Middle East again. But the real critical player, players are Syria and Iran. We really have to deal with this. Now, if you remember back in 2005, Syria is very badly isolated in the Middle East. Its actions in Lebanon, ultimately the assassination of Rafiq Hariri, uh, very much isolates uh, Lebanon in uh, Syria in the world community, and the Syrians are forced to pull their forces out of, of Lebanon. 
The Russians seize on this, on the isolated position of Syria, uh, waive almost 80% of the debt Syria owed the former Soviet Union, promise to sell them arms, not as many arms as the Syrians want, agree to have joint exploration for oil and natural gas in Syria, and essentially embrace the Syrians while they're being diplomatically isolated. Uh, so this is, this is one thing. Iran, much more important. The Iranian uh, relationship with Russia is, in some ways, love and hate. Uh, and most recently clear on Bushir. I did a, a study of Putin's uh, policy toward Iran. If anybody's interested, you can download it for free from the U.S. Army War College. Um, and it deals with the situation up to 2007, but it's pretty well held. Basically this. Russia needs Iran as an ally, especially during the offensive period of Putin from 2004 to 2008. Iran was the leading anti-American force in the region. Russia was now becoming increasingly anti-American. They fed each other. Also, continued problem in the North Caucasus, uh, and Iranians kept a low profile. Iranians paid for Bushir. Iran was buying weapons, etc. So after hemming and hawing in 2003-2004, in 2005, Putin made a strategic decision, which was, we're going to go ahead and sell the nuclear fuel for Bushir, which he had been holding back on, because we need to cement the relationship. And a few months later, there's a billion-dollar arms deal, which includes the TOR anti-missile short-range 20-kilometer weapon, which can be used short range to protect the Iranian nuclear installations. Now all this, despite, I emphasize this, Iran breaking off negotiations with the European Union. The Iranian, new Iranian president, Ahmadinejad, denying the Holocaust, saying Israel should be wiped off the map. Uh, the Russians go ahead and you know, do this anyway. Then comes January of 2006, the election of Hamas. Uh, the Hamas victory in the Palestine Legislative Council elections. Now, this was a shock to the U.S. Uh, Mr. Bush and the other research that has Mr. Dorsey mentioned that I'm doing on U.S. policy in the Middle East. Mr. Bush, George W. Bush, had this huge democratization policy which suddenly collapses with the election of Hamas. Now, the fact that Hamas was elected because of splits <coughs> within Fatah Old Guard versus Young Guard. Again, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, what was going on in a poorly run election campaign. Nonetheless, Hamas won and left the U.S. in a quandary. In fact, Putin, in one of his more offensive statements said, this is the biggest blow to American diplomacy in the Middle East since World War II. Well, you know, uh, you know and we are going to gain from it. So he invites a Hamas delegation to come to Moscow. Now, you have to understand, Russia is part of the diplomatic quartet formed, you know, uh, to try to solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem. And the quartet made a, met immediately, at, and that's Russia, remember, the UN, the EU, and the United States. Now, they met immediately after the elections and agreed not to recognize Hamas until they accepted all previous Palestinian treaties with Israel, Oslo 1, Oslo 2, renounced terrorism and recognized Israel. Uh, and that was the position, and it lasted three weeks until bump, Putin invites a delegation of Hamas to Moscow and gave them diplomatic legitimacy. Now, this was useful at the time for several reasons. One, the general Arab consensus in 2006 was, we'll give Hamas a little bit of time to change its position, so Russia was working with the general Arab consensus. But more to the point as far as Russia was concerned, they extracted something from Hamas. That was a statement, a public statement from Ismail Khania that the Chechen problem is an internal problem of Russia, not an Islamic problem. The Chechen rebel response to this was, Hamas, what you've done is un-Islamic to do this. But anyway, that was the trade-off. And remember goal number four of Putin, 
weaken to the greatest degree possible support uh, for uh, the Chechen and the Islamist rebels in the North Caucasus. So you had this development. Then in July of 2006, you had the Israeli war with Hezbollah. The Russians very clearly backing Syria and Hezbollah in the war, turned the other eye this way when the Syrians were shipping off anti-tank missiles to Hezbollah, leading to huge protests in no avail from the Israelis, and attempts by the US to sanction Iran were vetoed by Russia. So you had this phenomenon. So if you add this all together, you know, I've, this is the period I call of the embrace of the rogues by Russia. Iran, Syria, Hamas, Hezbollah. Okay, this gives you entree to the Middle East. However, especially after the Israel-Hezbollah war, Arab suspicion rose of, about Iran and what it was doing with Hamas and Hezbollah. And the Russians realized that, you know, <coughs> we want to make inroads with the Sunni Arabs. We might have to make a few gestures in the other direction. Hence, before Putin set out on his very important visit to Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Bahrain in 2000, February 2007, for the first time, Russia agreed to very limited sanctions against Iran and he agreed a second round of, again, very limited sanctions when he came back. But what was this purpose? This was a business trip and an Islamic trip together. Business trip, especially with the Saudis, trying to get Saudi investment in the Russian economy, in the GLONASS satellite system, banking agreements, selling the Saudis arms, uh, Jordan, uh, somewhat similar idea. And by the way, Libya made a similar trip to Libya in, in 2008 for contracts uh, for Russian companies, including arms and the railroad that I mentioned. So this was now an attempt to court the Sunnis. And other gestures were during 2007 to court the Sunnis. Again, did not deliver the uh, uranium to the Iranians, claiming that the Iranians hadn't paid for talking about $25 million is not a lot of money here, but this is, again, a gesture. You're trying to ride both horses, the Sunni horse and the Iranian Shia horse, at the same time, with mixed results. In any case, uh, what enabled the Russians to go ahead with this uh, nuclear deal was the rather unfortunate American intelligence report in uh, the end of, of 1997 that Iran had stopped its uh, effort to develop nuclear weapons. And that report was denounced throughout most of the American bureaucracy. Uh, but nonetheless, this was policy. Uh, George Bush, if you read his memoirs, has some interesting things to say about it, saying he couldn't overturn it even though he wanted to. Uh, but anyway, this gave the Russians the okay and effectively to February 2008, the, the Iranian was sent there, and now they're going to begin to develop Bushir. Now, however, some other things were on the horizon. And this was the economic crisis, which took place in, in the end of 2000, really the fall of 2008. It was preceded by the Russian invasion of Georgia. Now, if you all recall what happened in the clash, Georgia wants to join NATO. Georgia has two uh, areas, Abkhazia and Southern Ossetia, which are de facto independent and dependent on, on, on Russia. Anyway, a five-day war breaks out. And the Russians are able to defeat the Georgians, although they don't have very good doing it. But then capital flight begins from Russia, and very soon you have a worldwide economic crisis, not directly related to that, related to other banking problems. But the Russians are hit very hard. When oil prices were way up there, hitting $147 a barrel, in July of 2007, the, the Russians had about $400 billion in that sovereign fund. Uh, because Putin, one of his wiser moves, had put aside money from oil for really a, a rainy day fund. And that rainy day came in 2008. They had to use a lot of that fund just to bail out the Russian economy. Uh, so at this point, the aggressive policy stopped. 
as Russia became much more dependent on the world. At the same time, Russian natural gas and oil were peaking, and, uh, and then Putin, who had opposed Western investment in Russian oil before that, now suddenly started soliciting Western investment in oil. And the, the classic case for this, for those of you I know who are interested in, in energy questions, uh, the Russians had squeezed out BP, essentially, from the TNK BP uh, joint development in Siberia. All of a sudden, they were now soliciting support from BP again. And as I mentioned, from Total, from State Oil, etc. So during the crisis, you had new developments. The Russians suddenly became much more cooperative. Medvedev, by 2009, was saying, you know, the way the Iranians are behaving, sanctions might be necessary. And while throughout the early part of 2010, the Russian commentators are going back and forth and back and forth, would we sanction, would we not sanction, by May, June, sanctions for the first time against Iran were serious including not sending the SAM-300 surface-to-air missile. Now, those of you not familiar with the military technology, uh, I mentioned already the TOR missile. But the SAM missile has a, the SAM-300 has a 200-kilometer range, which means if the U.S. or Israel attacks, its planes can be engaged from 200 kilometers away. It's a rather effective weapon. And not providing those to the Iranians, which made the Iranians furious, by the way, uh, you know, it looked like Putin was choosing the U.S. over Iran, and good reason. Wanted to start talks. The Russians really wanted the START treaty signed in the U.S. And knowing if they cooperated over Iran, it would be a lot easier to get it through the U.S. Senate than it would be otherwise. And if you look at the timing of it, you know, as it was going to the Senate, uh, that was done. Uh, Medvedev was in Washington eating cheeseburgers with President Barack Obama and talking about setting up this huge Silicon Valley for Russia outside of Moscow. Again, you're not going to get this if you're not cooperative. The Russians became much more willing to allow a shipment of American goods through Afghanistan. And the Iranians, from their perspective, felt, oh, we're getting sold out on the altar of U.S.-Iranian relations. But again, this was a period when the Russians were relatively weak. Okay? I remind, I remind you of this. Okay. And this brings us really to our situation today. Um, we've had a series of Russian or Russian comments on the Middle East revolutions. And the question really is. Domestic Russian politics and Russian foreign policy and energy all play into it. There is an opposition in Russia. It's small. It has some intellectuals like Boris Nemtsov leading it. And if I, I trust everybody here has been following the events in Egypt, right? So you remember after Ben Ali fell in Tunisia, the Egyptians were in the streets saying, okay, Ben Ali is gone, Mubarak, pack up your bags, you're next, which is one of the chants in Egypt. Okay, now the opposition in Russia was saying, the train stopped in Egypt, its next stop is Moscow, Vladimir Putin, pack your bags. Okay, so you had this domestic effect, and of course, the natural reaction you probably already guessed from what I've said before, from the Russians, which was, the West is out to undermine us with these kinds of revolutions. You had Medvedev saying it. You had Putin saying it. But interestingly enough, the one Russian who knows the Middle East, and Medvedev doesn't, <coughs> and Putin doesn't, but Yevgeny Primakov does. And Primakov said, now wait a minute, he said this on TV, a real first time I've ever seen him totally contradict Putin and Medvedev. He said, no, wait a minute. These are homegrown revolutions without foreign influences. So you, you have this. On the other hand, the economics have proved a boom short run to Russia. Several reasons. One, oil price goes up, 
To balance their budget, Russians need an oil price, Brent, not West Texas. Brent oil, $103 a barrel. When it's $115 a barrel, boy, that's a bonus. So instead of having to dive into their sovereign wealth fund to, to pay off the increased wages and pensions that Putin's did it, and with the crisis of 2008, now they can put money back into the sovereign fund. That's a bonus. Second bonus, Putin goes to Europe, you may have seen this last week, tells the Europeans, look guys, you really want to get your natural gas from North Africa? That's an unstable area. Invest in us. Now, remember what happened. In 2006 and 2009, the Russians cut off energy to Ukraine. Uh, that meant the pipelines go from Ukraine straight through to Europe. The Europeans looked around and started getting more natural gas from North Africa. Well, the Russians say, you guys aren't going to be able to do that anymore. We're more stable. And hence Total invested and, and BP, etc. Now, there's probably less to that than meets the eye. Uh, because in the long run, the U.S. is now selling shale gas to Europe. Uh, and the Europeans are looking for shale gas as well. So if, that, if they really develop that well and it's done safely, which it hasn't always been done in the U.S. safely, that will lessen European dependence on Russia for, for natural gas. Nonetheless, the investment is there. Uh, the final point I think we should mention, because this is, after all, the Middle East Institute, and I would be remiss, remiss if I didn't mention it, could Middle East type revolutions come to Russia? I mean, it's, in some ways, they're very similar. Rentier economies, depending on oil, to buy off, they think, the population, corruption, cronyism, a lot of youth don't see a way up and hence are emigrating, which you can't always do in the Middle East. You know, a lot of interesting similarities. But before, and you know, I've been reading this in the papers. And, and it's, these guys are going to carry away. They don't realize two factors. Number one, Russia had its revolution in 1991. And nine years of chaos under Yeltsin followed. Do they really want to do this again? Secondly, they look at Ukraine and the Orange Revolution <coughs> in Ukraine, which was basically a failure. So I think there, again, I, I will end as I began with Sho and Lai's comment about the French Revolution of 1789, and it was asked in 1954, he said, too early to tell. It, it, the, the, it is too early to tell. We, we're not sure how the revolutions in the Middle East are going to go. We don't know how the Egyptian uh, Revolution in particular, which is critical, is going to go. We don't know if the Saudis are going to get swept up, up in it or not. And I think the, the jury is still out on the final Russian reaction to this. But, I think I've had my quota of time, and now we have time, Mr. Dorsey, for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for a very clear and concise overview. Uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Would you please, when you ask the question, identify yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Patrick. I'm from uh, Nian. Okay, uh, two questions. Um, this relates to the uh, Russia's role from a defensive to offensive and then defensive again from two, 2000 to 2010. And uh, the factors from your explanation to my understanding is Russia has been reacting according to the situation. Like the most recent one, uh, you quoted this uh, the North, the, uh, North America, uh, North, North, uh, North Africa in uh, this. Uh, Gaddafi, in the Gaddafi, uh, okay, Li Libya, in the Libya, so it reacted quite fast and it, it offered to connect back the oil gas supply. So from this and uh, your previous explanation, Russia is a more uh, and on the passive in changing its role from offensive, defensive, offensive throughout the uh, era of uh, his uh, Putin's era as from a president to prime minister. Okay. So how do you comment this change in a passive mode? Is the role of played by Russia uh, the influence on terrorism in the East or even in the global region? 
if Russia play a more active role than a passive role, will it actually have a better influence on Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, terrorism uh, activities in the global uh, area of influence? Any difference on the role played by Russia? Because Russia has been quite new, uh, neutral and independent uh, to the attitude towards this uh, terrorism, terrorist group, the major terrorist group in the world. So that's all. Thanks. Okay, a very good question. In fact, you summarized my lecture very nicely. Uh, you almost added to it, which I appreciate, you know, defensive to offensive to defensive and maybe back offensive again, now that the oil price has risen, uh, <clears throat> with Russian policy toward Poland and Again, in that part of it is too early to judge. I mean, if you look at the Libyan thing that you mentioned, uh, initially Russia was against sanctions. Then it agreed to sanctions, even though it cost the Russians $2 billion in military contracts with Libya, and another $1.8 uh, billion under study, but opposed the no-fly zone. Now, what's fascinating, to me at least, on, on this part of your question is, as I think everybody here knows, the Arab League just came out in favor of the no-fly zone. So if Russia now opposes the no-fly zone, it's going to be opposing the Arab League, which it doesn't want to do. Uh, the Russian rhetoric on this no-fly zone is rather interesting. Um, they were blasting the U.S., which of course we had a no-fly zone. The U.S. had a no-fly zone over Iraq, if you remember, uh, to, pr to protect the Kurds in the north. They should have had one to protect the Shia in the south, but that's a whole other story. Um, it, this will be bear, bear watching, and then we'll know if we're offensive or defensive uh, again. Now, in terms of terrorism, the Soviet Union was a major backer of many terrorist groups in the world. Russia suffering its own terrorist attacks in Chechnya has not been a backer of terrorism. What it calls Hamas, what Putin specifically said is, Hamas is not on our terrorist list. It is a political organization, and I'm quoting him now from memory, hopefully correctly. It is a political organization that has support from Palestinians. We treat it as a political organization. Well, when I talked to the Russians about this, what they told me is they're going to teach Hamas to accept a two-state solution to have diplomatic relations with Israel as part of an Israeli-Palestinian agreement. Well, that was 2006, still hasn't happened. Uh, Russian influence in Hamas is, is rather limited, which I think, if I can carry your question one step further, enables me to uh, make a sort of a general conclusion about Putin, which is Putin has restored the Russian presence to the Middle East. No question about it. Ten visits to the Middle East showing the flag everywhere, investment, arms sales, etc. But how much real influence does Russia have? It hasn't convinced Hamas to make a deal with Israel. It hasn't been able to forge unity between Hamas and Fatah, although it said it wants to. It hasn't been able to get the, the Iranians to stop developing their nuclear facilities. It hasn't gotten them to, to provide information to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, so, you know, they have presence, but not a lot of influence. And successful in business, yes. They made some good business deals. But even in the Iranian sanctions, which they agreed upon, and the SAM 300s, I don't want to deprecate or, or, or minimize that, the one thing they didn't agree on was cutting off oil and oil investment in Iran. Because that would really be the thing to, to break the Iranian. That they refused to because for reasons that I've already mentioned, uh, they need the oil that they're developing with Iran and the energy, natural gas developing with Iran for their own needs. So maybe we're somewhere between the offensive and defensive. Okay. You mentioned Yeltsin with quite a glee when he fell from grace. And you were very partial to Putin. But I think in the sweep of things, 
and the Russians have great economies to have contracted. They talk about a long sweep of 50 years. And in the last 50 years, Russian influence in the Middle East, in Syria, in Egypt, in Libya, has been very arms related. And the economy, whatever influence they have on the economy, is actually a legacy problem now. Because in the Russian model, and in the Middle East model, very strong state, very weak civil society. And maybe that's one of the inheritance we have in the last 50 years in Russia, rather than the issue of Putin. Because if history to the French Revolution is too early to tell, Putin is too early to tell. It's the history Russian of the last 50 years. Okay, again, a very interesting question. Um, Yeltsin, okay. I have studied Russia for 50 years. Perfect perfect time. And um, maybe I identify too much with Russian history. But Yeltsin really bungled, really bungled Russia. He was drunk a lot of the time. Uh, his governmental policies were semi-insane. He would get up from being drunk. He would fire a number of ministers. He would go back and drink again. Uh, you wound up with the economic crisis of 1998 primarily as a result of his mismanagement of the one. Now, Putin, and I, I, I take your point very seriously, and maybe too early to judge Putin, and it's always a danger for a historian to put things in 2000, 2004, 2000, okay. Um, but so be it, you have to try rather than, than not try at all. Uh, yeah, there is a legacy, and that's one of the differences between Putin and Medvedev. The data says we're depending too much on our Soviet legacy and not developing an ec economically enough. But Putin was saying, no, our Soviet legacy was a positive one. We can, we can build on it. And in terms of Syria and Iran, um, in the case of Syria, really there was a, from the time the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 until Putin vi visited Syria in, in 2005, the, the, the Syrians and the Russians did not get along. The Russians wanted to be repaid for this huge Syrian debt. And the Syrians said, no, our debt was to the Soviet Union, not to Russia as a successor state. So it wasn't until Putin, as I said, went on the offensive there. In the case of Iran, again, it's an inter it's, you know, the Russians worry about Iran because it is an internal threat to them vis-a-vis -vis the, the North Caucasus also Central Asia. They're very appreciative, I didn't mention this, to the Iranians helping them get a ceasefire in the Tajik Civil War in 1997. That was, that was, that was important. Um, on the other hand, Russia, particularly in, its, in the second defensive period from 2008 to 2010, really needed an infusion of Western money, really needed a strategic arms deal, and were willing to sacrifice part of its relationship with Iran to get it. Uh, now, Interestingly enough, what did we see yesterday? Yesterday, one of the Russian arms ministers said, you know, we can go back to selling arms to Iran. We just have to be careful what we sell them. So there's still that impulse underneath to sell the arms. Um, we'll see. This, this latest period, it, again, I, it's really too early to tell whether we've moved again from a defensive to an offensive posture because the price of oil is going up. The Russian economy, you know, benefits from that, but you've got still the old problems of corruption, cronyism, mismanagement, gas promise mismanaged, a lot of that's why they need a lot of Western investment and, and technology in there. The key way to check this, by the way, and I think the ultimate check will be, is if, as in Putin's offensive period, when Western investment comes in and then the Russians try to squeeze the Westerners out has happened in TNKBP, has happened in Shell. Then we'll know. It hasn't happened yet. And then we'll know if they've they gone back to the conference. I think we're in a period of flux, and it's only been two months. No, but that's not my question. Yeah. My question is, if you look at 50 years, Russian influence in this Middle East, in terms of helping the economy. No, you're right. There, it, was, it was primarily arms sales. From 1955, with the first arms deal with Egypt. 
okay, through the end of 1991, really through Gorbachev's period in, in, in 1985, arms sales were the primary, and, and don't forget diplomatic support of the UN, etc. Uh, under Putin, they're now trying to, to have serious economic ties. We see this definitely with, with Turkey. We see this to a certain extent in the joint deals with Iran. We see this with Saudi Arabia now. So that's, that's really the big difference between the two. It's much more emphasis on, by Putin on the economic ties, which also benefits Russia. I have two questions. First, I think from the Middle East, the Russian foreign policy is, has not been credible because it's not predictable. It's not like a pragmatic approach, like the US policy, or a principal approach, as they claim. And so there's a lot of lack of coherence. I don't want to ask you on the non-fly zone in Libya, which seems like Gaddafi is either gone or he will be, if he stay, will be a war indicted. That's, there isn't much economic interest. So what's exactly the motive of Russia? Is it really domestic uh, because of non-intervention? He's thinking about uh, Caucasus, Chechnya, Negoshetia, Ossetia, but it's not very clear why he opposed the non-fly zone. Uh, my second question was also related to having the can, can eat it. Um, it's not very clear, actually, also in the U.S.-Israeli um, conflict. It seems like he would take a different approach to the U.S. approach. So he will take a, a more pro-Arab approach, although the Arab leave the U.S. is not a, 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 a neutral, but it's an important partner. You would expect that he would take a more... Um, pro-Arab approach to the Quartlet. My question, many argue that his religious views are, um, um, and his um, ambitions of having back the Russian Empire, the, the Orthodox Church has a specific interest and a lot of assets in the Holy Land, and that's what's uh, pushing. So I want to get your views about the role of his religious views into 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 the current stand on the Arab-Israeli. Um. Okay, uh, very good questions uh, on the no-fly zone. If you look at the official statements that are made, remember, in um, the U.S. used no-fly zone in Iraq against the will of Russia and against the will of the Soviet Union for uh, against the will of Russia. Uh, we also saw American intervention in Bosnia, ironically on the side of Muslims, by the way, against Christians, and in, and in Kosovo on the side of Muslims against Christians. So to say that the U.S. is anti-Muslim, you know, as some have argued, is certainly not true. Uh, basically, these all took place over the objections of Russia. And hence, they have bad memories that, that they couldn't stop a no-fly zone in which they had not participated in making. Russians are very interested in international organizations, especially the UN, especially the UN Security Council, because they see that as curbing American unilateralism. Okay? That's why they, they, they try to divert everything they can to the UN Security Council. No-fly zones in Russia did sign a number of agreements with Libya. Uh, during the 2008 visit of Putin. Uh, again, as I mentioned, $2 billion in arms and negotiating another $1.8 billion in arms. Major railroad, major oil and natural gas. So they have something to lose here. Uh, but I think the no-fly zone, more than anything else, is it's something that should be done. It's a military thing. It's something that should be done with the UN Security Council, where we have the right to speak. New you Europeans and, and Americans should do it by yourself. But now, with the Arab League coming out in favor of the no-fly zone, it's going to be interesting to see if the Russians actually oppose it. Uh, and that would mean opposing the will of the Arab League, which they don't like to do. They like to be in sync with the Arab League wherever possible. Um, now, in terms of Putin and religion, <laughs> what's the nicest way to put this? Um, Putin manipulates religion. Okay? 
Putin sees the church as an ally. Uh, the new patriarch was handpicked by Putin, surreal. Um, he's leaned over backwards and back the church. Remember, in Tsarist days, the Orthodox Church was the main support of the regime. And, and in a time of difficulty and problems to have the church, which is getting somewhat more influential in Russia as a major supporter, is helpful. But in, in Russian, we have a term called Ketok Haba, which means who is manipulating whom. And I think Putin is manipulating the church. And the church is making the most of being manipulated to get more money, to get more churches built. I mean, you, I don't know if you've all been to Moscow recently. Some of the churches they built in St. Petersburg, unbelievable. I mean, churches filled blood where Alexander II was assassinated. It's gorgeous churches they've done. So both sides benefit, but I think Putin uh, benefits more. You're right about the church property in Jerusalem. This is very important. Um, this is another lever of influence. And as part of deals made between the United States and Israel, uh, uh, between Israel and Russia, some of the church property has been returned to Russia, which the Israelis had held for many years, and before that the British after the Russian Revolution. So the question is who held it? Uh, the Soviets, did they held it, but they were atheists and so they shouldn't have it. Or the white Russians abroad, uh, who still kept the religion, but now that after 1991, very long and detailed negotiations between the Israelis uh, and the Russians over. And, and the, the stuff has been and sold back, or given back, in fact. Uh, and this is very important because then the church sends, you know, delegates and missionaries, etc. cetera. Uh, people on pilgrimage go there. And it's another thing that binds the Israelis and the Russians. Um, but that having been said, it's something, at least that I see, that Putin uses the church rather than being a believer in the church. After all, he's ex KGB. And these are not going to be church believers. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, thank you for providing our context for Russian foreign policy. Because I think just a bit. Oh, I'm Edwin from NUS. So I'd like to thank you for your providing our context on Russian matters for your presentation. I got three comments to make. Uh, firstly, I mean. I, I realize that you don't include Afghanistan in the part of Middle East, but I was just wondering um, how would uh, Russia make use of Afga Afghanistan in its uh, regional strategy? Because you mentioned that uh, whenever uh, America is weak in certain countries, uh, Russia opportunizes it, and Afgan Afghanistan seems to be the case. Uh, secondly, well, how is um, Russia going to use regional organizations such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in relation to Middle East, like uh, with regards to 2009, they organized a conference in Afga about uh, Afghanistan with SEO. And that was sort of implicitly sort of like uh, suggesting a counterbalance to America and NATO. So I'd like, like to comment about that. And thirdly, um, um, the speaker met, uh, someone commented about the uh, Russia's role in that religion, uh, religious role. And I mean, when you read Russia's foreign policy concept, they always mention Russia as a civilizational player. So how, how do you think Russia's potentials in developing such a civilization role, especially, especially for Middle East, which is like historical, like Russia? Thank you. Okay, again, very good questions. On Afghanistan, the Russians, of course, had some bitter experiences in Afghanistan. And it was the pull out of Afghanistan that began the unraveling of the Soviet Empire. Um, right now, they don't want the Taliban to win, bluntly. And they've been willing, it appear, to improve U.S. Russian relations in the last two years. What Mr. Biden, Vice President Biden of the United States, if you had a chance to read today's International Herald Tribune, he reviews the reset strategy uh, in Russian-American relations and, uh, you know, allowing American cargoes to go through Afghanistan, um, uh, to go through Russia to get to Afghanistan. Basically, they don't want the Taliban to win because they're afraid that that would precipitate more religious extremism into Russia proper and into, into Central Asia. As far as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is concerned, there's another way to look at it. Um, if you adopt the Russian description of it, and uh, I hate to mention today's newspapers, but there's such good stuff in here. Today's Straits Times has got an interview uh, with uh, Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, some of you may have seen. 
where he talks in glowing terms about the SCO and adding members and Iran is a, is a candidate member, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's really not the way to look at it. Originally, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was formed by China and Russia and Central Asia as a means of balancing off Russia and China. What's happened since, though, is that China's economy and influence in the world has boomed. Russia's has, especially in the last few years, has stagnated. And Russian or Chinese movement economically into Central Asia is getting larger and larger and larger. And Central Asia is going to be, you know, some of us looked at this 10, 15 years ago, and this is almost very predictable. Essentially, Central Asia will become an economic appendage of China, raw material appendage of China. Oil, natural gas, etc. Uh, now, here's where the Middle Eastern revolutions come in. Uh, a lot of the people there are vulnerable in Central Asia. And uh, Uzbekistan, and, you know, Karima, and, and, and some of these guys uh, are vulnerable. Um, whether it will happen, and that would jeopardize the raw material supply to China. That having been said, uh, I think the way to look at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization now is more and more a struggle for influence between the Russians who can provide some security aid and the Chinese who can provide more and more economic benefits. Uh, okay, um, civilization, Russia is a civilization. For Russia to be a civilization, you have to have a rule of law. There is no rule of law in Russia. You can look at the Khodorkovsky case, you can look at any other cases. You don't have transparency. You don't really have people wanting to emulate what's going on in Russia, quite honestly. So as much as they talk about Russia as a civilization, it's just not.